you so much for being here. And it's um, our pleasure to have Dr. Ramya Ranganathan over here with us today to do this session. Um, there are so many hats that Ramya wears. She's a life coach, workshop facilitator, also faculty at Bank, uh, IM Bangalore. Uh, she has a BTEC in electronics from IIT Madras, a PGDM from IIM Ahmedabad, and a PhD in organizational behavior from London Business School. So you can see all the marquee institutes right there. She has been awarded by the MHRD government of India for being one of the top 15 innovators in higher education in India. Her training, again, is very impressive and quite extensive um, and it spreads across coaching with depth method methodology in life and leadership coaching, uh, pranic psychotherapy, Reiki, access consciousness, and in yogic pranic to holistic development. She integrates multiple modalities and creates customized meditations to help shift mindsets, limiting beliefs, and emotional blocks. So I think we're all very lucky to have her here with us. So over to you, Ramya. Thank you. Thank you, Charu, and um, hello, everybody. Good morning. And um, as we get started, it is indeed my joy and pleasure to be here. I love it when a group of women come together. There's a special magic that doesn't have a word as of yet in my head, but it is that special coming together, and I'm so glad to be a part of it. Uh, my only request to all of you is to turn your videos on if possible because you know just before we started uh, Bhavna and Charu were talking and I overheard and I chipped in and I was like yes Zoom is our life so last evening we had we have weekly and sometimes bi-weekly family get-togethers even that's on Zoom so there is this Zoom fatigue and you know uh, as an instructor or as a facilitator Sometimes it feels like I'm just speaking to the computer screen and I know everyone's here, but you're in physically different places. So it just makes it that much more easier, that much more fun, that much more interactive, good for me. And eventually good for everyone who's a part of the session because we all come alive when we can actually see at each other's faces and expressions. So um, I've just noticed this hands down that when I know the people I'm talking to, at least in terms of the visual cues and eyes, there's just so much more that I have to open up and offer in that moment. So please do turn your videos on. And um, also just to let you know, I am a visual person. So um, I get inputs from your faces and expressions. So even if you don't speak out aloud, I would know when to shut up on a topic and when to move on. And when you're getting bored, if I could see your faces and if I can't see your faces, there's a risk that I'm just ranting on with something that I think is important, which is not important to anybody else in the group. So please, at least for that sake, turn your videos on. Okay. And as we get started, um, I'm going to invite you to join me for a quick two minute or even just one minute of a centering exercise to um, connect us all, even though we might be in different places. So are you game for that? Yeah. Okay, so let's close our eyes. Take a deep breath in. Breathe out. And in this moment, just connect with your body. And allow all the muscles of your body to relax. Thanking your body for supporting you in this moment. And for holding the space for us to be present for the next 90 minutes together. Your body is going to have to cooperate and be still and sit on a chair instead of jumping and dancing around. So let's get that body's cooperation in. Take another deep breath in, breathe out. And this time, let go of any thoughts or emotions that might be cluttering your inner space. You know, we have monkey minds, a million thoughts different emotions, all racing around in different directions. Just give yourself permission to put all of these aside and clear some space 
in that mind of ours, that sponge-like mind, to be present and open during this session and gathering when we've come together. Take another deep breath in, fill up your lungs, breathe out. And this time, give yourself permission to connect with the most strong, resourceful, creative part of you, inside of you. You know this part of you. We access it sometimes. Let's access it now. And let this resourceful, strong, and creative aspect of us come into the driving seat of our mind for the next 90 minutes. And longer if you want. This is also a lovely moment to invite in any form of divine support, guidance, assistance, companionship that you would like to, if you would like to. Take another deep breath in, breathe out. Acknowledging your complete presence in this moment, in this time-space reality where we are coming together for this dialogue, circle, discussion, opening. And whenever you're ready, open your eyes and I'm here present for you. Okay, lovely. And now I feel like we are actually connected and present here together. So let's get started. So I'm going to get um, start with a case study because I also wear the hat of a school professor and in business school we use case studies and the best case study that I have here is really me and I'm going to share a little from my life here so you get to know me better you also get to know the approach and what I mean by crafting our lives and the inside out approach and then we'll see how we can start using that each one of you can start using that in your own life so I'm going to share a screen here Is this visible? Yes, yeah. it is. So, yes, it is. This is my <clears throat> intro come CV screen that has been put together during for Zoom webinars. So this is what I use at the start of any workshop. This is how I introduce myself. So this is my story. And if you look at it, it looks quite nice, neatly organized. It's sort of chronological as well. It has the education there, it has the corporate experience, it has the academic career, it has the outcomes, the tick marks, as Charu was saying. Uh, it has the stuff in there. And there is a story here, and there is a journey. And it is a story and journey that I am indeed proud of. But it's not a complete journey. So let's look, um, so let me tell you the story here. And then I'll give you some more aspects to it. So after I finished my engineering, I was one of the, uh, those people who went into an MBA without working. So I took that engineering mindset into my MBA, which meant I looked at the world through equations, through numbers, through optimization programs, through a problem solving lens, trying to find solutions. And and that's the lens through which my brain actually looked at whatever an MBA had to offer to me, which meant the subjects like quantitative methods, like operations management made complete sense to me. What did not make so much sense was subjects like, you know, um, strategy or uh, marketing where there is, where, you know, there isn't a right answer. It's all contextual and situational. And what didn't make sense to me at all was organizational behavior, because that's a subject where, uh, let's look at the variables in that subject. Things like happiness, motivation, leadership. Can any of these be completely accurately well-defined? All right, they don't have 
standard definitions. Can they be measured? Yes, there are measurement scales, but it's not one measurement scale. It's not like physics, where you have a way of converting one scale of temperature to another, and it's always going to be that way. Can we have predictable, controllable models? For example, can I create a model, an equation where I say, let's say I want to increase Krupa's satisfaction in her workplace by 40%, and then I do this and this and this, and there goes. Can I guarantee that result? No, I can't do that. But those are the kinds of models that my brain had been trained to think of as useful during my engineering studies, right? And so this did not meet that criteria. And so what did my brain do? My brain said, this is useless. Yeah, this is all fluff stuff. I can't create results with this. So I didn't really pay attention to it. And I just studied to pass the exams, which as I know some of you would know, it can be a completely parallel game that has nothing to do with learning. And I did that part of it, which I was quite good at and moved on. So if I, when I worked, if you see, I was really, really interested in the topic of efficiency, which I would still def define as an engineer's output by input. And I loved operations management, and that's what I went into, into my, in my early career. So if you look at ICICI and Citibank, even though they were banks, I was not working in finance. I was always working in technology, process re-engineering, operations, trying to make things more effective and impactful. And that's when I started hitting multiple wow, wow, okay? So one was, of course, on the work front itself, where, you know, in a nutshell, basically 5% of what I actually worked on me and my teammates was actually being implemented useful. So that was very, very disheartening to me as a young MBA graduate. What was also happening is if you've heard of Monday morning blues, I was experiencing it on every day of the week, every afternoon, evening, if I stayed long enough and I was really, really unhappy with my life. And I was asking these questions, why am I working at all? And uh, existential crisis or quarter life crisis as we know it now. It was, a, it was a hard time, a bad time. Lots of tears, lots of darkness, lots of complaints, lots of rants. So I did what I knew to do best, which is actually one of my key strengths, which I'm trying to get out of, but that's complaining. So I complained to anyone and everyone who would listen. And fortunately, I had people who gave me a bunch of advice. And some of it was, hey, you know what, you were a good student. So maybe you should just get into academics. And maybe you should, maybe you should just study further. This is not the end of life. You can do something. And I was like, yeah, OK. So I applied for a PhD in operations. And I was sort of like running away, trying to make sense of my life, trying to do something. And I happened to write to an ex-faculty member of mine at IMA. She was Indira Parekh, and she was the dean then, which was also an awesome person for a reco letter, which is one of the take marks that you need for a PhD. And she was really nice. She didn't do what a lot of people do, which is, hey, I'll look at your grades and I'll write you a good recommendation letter. She actually asked me, why do you want to do a PhD? So I gave her this whole dump of complaints. <laughs> And this is what happens in the corporate world and blah, 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 and it's no use and things are not effective and efficient and the world doesn't work. And she heard me out. She heard out everything, all my complaints. And she said, you know what, Ramya, you should do a PhD. You're asking all the right questions. And I was like, questions? And she said, but why are you studying operations further? But if, because if you look at all the questions in your head, they're about the relationship between people, work, performance, productivity, you should study organizational behavior. That's what this subject deals with. And I was like, that subject? The one that was not, you know, had variables that could not be defined, models that could not be predicted, results cannot be guaranteed. You want me to study that? But there seemed to be a ring of truth. And besides, you know what? I was so blah with the world and blah with what I'm doing that her confidence somehow just seemed to rub off on me. And, and she was the first person who instead of, sort of reflecting back to me that I had a head full of nonsense and complaints and misery. She said, you have questions there to explore. She made it sound like a very noble quest. And so I latched onto that little one string of hope and confidence. And I was like, okay, I'll study this. And, and yes, you know, so when I went on to do my PhD, I still remember the first day in class where, you know, there was this uh, faculty member who asked us all to um, introduce why we were there. And I stood and I said, I'm here to study the person work relationship. He was like, wow, you have a buzzword there. 
But I did have, and that was that was the thing. So I did have some sort of a purpose and some sort of a question. And, and I took that question further. And of course, you know, that's the question I've been exploring through my work, through my academic career, through the research, through the PhD, but also in parallel in which I will tell you soon about. I explored it in Buddhist texts. I explored it in Hindu philosophy. I, ex I explored it in talking to people. So literally, I would be on vacations and I would go around asking people, why do you think people work? Why do you think people work? Like randomly, like right? so, so every aspect of my life was sort of this, what we call it ethnography or, you know, like qualitative interviews. Not all of it fluid, uh, you know, flowed into my dissertation or formal studies, but this was the question. And I still remember um, I was on vacation with my family, with my parents in Scotland. And, and I was still doing this there also, you know, because I, I am an extrovert and and I'd like to get as many inputs. And we were on this guided walk and chatting up with people with us. And there was this woman, must have been in her 60s or something. And I asked her the same question. And she was like, and she gave me this beautiful answer. She was, why? For love, of course. Why else? And I was like, love? I had never connected work and love till then. And, and that answer stayed with me. At that moment, it seemed like the most bizarre thing. But she said it with a kind of confidence and conviction that I was like, I want to explore this further. Like, how, how is it possible that in someone else's head, work is so connected to love? And that became the next step, right? So my own discovery and research of the connection with, hum, you know, human beings and now work. So, and, and that's how it, you know, got, got into levels, got into different aspects of it, and it's still growing. And that continues to be pretty much the work that I've done, the leadership workshops that I do created, you know, I created some, uh, literally uh, one of my flagship offerings in the corporate world is, on, is called Leading with Joy. So I've done tons and tons of workshops on that, uh, you know, teach, uh, taught over a decade of courses. I still continue to teach that at IM Bangalore called Personal Values, Goals and Career Options. So it's, it's, so there's this whole body of work that's connected to people, their work, how they work, and how they can make it more meaningful. And that's um, and I have a course on that on edX as well, called Crafting Realities, Work, Happiness, and Meaning. And that's become my formal exploration. So there's this, this is one career journey. Okay, now I'm going to show you another slide, which is this one which I don't really talk about, which I don't show in my CV, but which is also me and which is my journey. And increasingly, I've started believing that this is the journey of crafting our lives as well. And this needs to be told, this needs to be owned, this needs to be brought in. Because when I show just the first slide that I showed you and tell that journey, there are a lot of people out there who look at this and they say, wow, okay, wow, you've made sense of your world and great. And, and there's more, which, which I don't talk about, which I don't show, which I don't tell, but which I think is important because not, not just because it shows how unpredictable and rich and diverse and messy in some words. I'm just going to use the word messy, but use it without judgment. All our lives are. But also because it's this mess that actually is also the manure, the fodder, the trigger points for so much else that then results in the fruits and flowers that you see outside. And uh, <clears throat> for the last two years, I've also been coaching people individually. So to, uh, as long as <clears throat> I was, you know, a, fa a full-time faculty at IIM Bangalore, I was only doing workshops and group workshops. And there's about so much that people open up and talk about in groups. Once I started doing private coaching, I realized that messy as my life and journey is, messy it is, for so many other people. I, of course, I don't know everyone's story, so I can't tell you everybody's lives are messy, but I do know this, that a lot of people, or at least the people who come to me and the people that I've had the privilege of getting a rich look at the richness and the insides of their lives and journeys, it is messy, it can be messy, and there's nothing really to feel 
bad, shamed, or judgmental about it. And uh, and that's why I want to you know show this to you and talk to you about some of these, and also talk to you about why these might look as bad things, sad things, or challenges. A, of course, we all go through them, and I've gone through them as well, and um, I might still go through more in the future. But I want to show you how they also act as the manure, as the fuel, okay? So um, they also help us grow. It at least it helped me grow, open up, seek out, look for more solutions, look for things, look for answers. So for example, when I was uh, diagnosed with clinical depression, it happened in a very weird way. I was in UK then, and my son was about a year and a half, and he was down with this cold and cough that hadn't gone away for two weeks. It was going on and on, and I'd gone to NHS to meet the doctor. And there was a waiting there. And by the time I met the doctor, and I was really worried and all of that. So, you know, I started telling the doctor all the symptoms and the case history and all. And she heard me out. And then she called an attendant and she told the attendant, hey, will you take this boy outside and just, you know, entertain him, keep him for some time and each doctor. And I was like, you know, why is she doing this? <laughs> and then she said, you know what? Your son is totally fine. It's a cold and cough and it's going to go. I'm really concerned about you. You're not okay. Fill up this questionnaire, answer these questions. And that's how, and she said, you're under severe depression. You need help. And I was so much in denial of that when I heard that. I was so much in denial. <laughs> and I don't know, I want to take you into that whole journey and how it happened. You know, in the beginning, I was just trying to fake it because I was also worried that I lose my child custody, which can happen in Europe if, you know, um, the mom's not fit to look after it, all of that. But, you know, after all that drama, part of the drama was also this curiosity and, okay, really, is it true? And that then took me into the subfield of positive psychology. So I was studying organizational behavior. So I was taking courses in psychology. I was looking at the relationship between human beings and work. But now this whole new stream about mental health and well-being opened up. And positive psychology became a huge part of my research and my journey and my exploration. Why? Because I wanted to understand it better, help myself better. And I did. And that journey then took its fields and subfields and branches. That's also when, you know, I really, um, I had already been exploring quite a few alternate modalities and philosophies, but even within those, it started branching into the subjects and top topics of happiness, well-being, peace, and all of that, mental health, basically, yeah? So, um, so that's, so everything is a gift, okay? And, and then, of course, you know, when I had to come, to, um, yeah you know, went through my own divorce, there was so much of unfolding, opening up, understanding of myself, relationships, growth. Same in, you know, when I started my entrepreneurial journey, I had a very toxic relationship with money, which I didn't realize was spilling over into so many other aspects of my life. So, you know, if I had to vacation, I would always be like, pick the cheapest, do the cheapest and literally strangulating myself in many ways. And that's another topic and journey by itself. But, you know, healing that, uncovering that, learning that, that's a beautiful journey that allows me now to be financially independent, but also, you know, use money in a resourceful way to help me do what I want to on the planet and live a life that works for me and create one that works for me. There was a time when uh, my son, when he was in grade two, he just stopped going to school. He was like, I'm not going. And we didn't know what was going on. And, you know, we did the initial therapy things, uh, didn't work, suggested by the principal, none of it worked. Eventually, we figured out it was a case of bullying. He, he's a very fast runner and he had, you know, run, outrun the supposedly the school champion who was in middle school. And there was a bunch of kids ganging up and we it took time to discover this because he didn't open up and then we could figure out and then we could, you know, and then started it was a it was a break in my career, break in my life completely, you know, the, and then re his school was really very cooperative, very happy. So they allowed us to reintegrate it. 
reintegrate him into school, but he was scared, which meant me going to school for an entire month. I went to school with him. <laughs> I remember it was October and I had all, you know, my colleagues at IIM Bangalore, they were just covering up for all my classes. They just had my back. And of course I had to then do it later. But for that one month, I had all these other people handling my classes and I was going to school in the school bus because bullying can happen there also, sitting in school, sitting outside the classes. There were some teachers who allowed me to, it's valley school, so it's fairly flexible, sit in class, like the Sanskrit teacher would invite me into classes. I made friends with the girls in his class who, you know, and then there was this gradual, I used to sit a little away and the girls would come in the break and tell me, tell me, auntie, auntie Siddhartha is fine today, auntie, auntie Siddhartha, you know, so there was this, whole ecosystem of integrating him back into the into school and and these things they're weird they're different they're breaks they're also very very educational right i just got to attend school once again and then it goes on right and then the physical health which then took me into you know exploring healing modalities and yeah so so multiple things and uh and here's yet another lens of looking at it in parallel through this whole journey. Some of the things that really kept me going through this is that I'm a poet. My first primary <laughs> identity, the one identity that didn't leave me every time everything else went away, I could still be a poet, I could still write poems. I've been writing poems since the age of five. I still do. For me, poetry has been a form of therapy, a form of channeling, a form of writing communication to myself, to the universe, to God, <laughs> all of that. And, uh, and that's, been, that's been like one of the strongholds of my life and journey. And then there are other you know, aspects to it. I had a near-death experience, a very gory fire accident and stampede that killed about 300 people. The, my friend sitting next to me died. My sister who was sitting the other side escaped, but there was a time during the stampede where I had to leave her hand because she was stuck. And again, something that I lived with that guilt for a long time. And I sort of let somebody take me to the hospital, but she was like all burnt and walking around looking for her younger sister amidst all the burnt dead bodies and stuff like that to escape. There was a time when I had to actually scramble through other people, other bodies that were dying. It was the survival instinct. And, and I got out. And for a long time, there was this, there's been a, you know, so again, that's another story. But just to tell you that, you know, uh, there are these weird things and different things that have, have shaped the evolution. Again, things that we don't talk about, things that take us more and more towards understanding ourselves and touching base with ourselves as a source of light, as a source of our lives that we can be. And it's been a journey of pulling that. So I've, um, I've lived in ashram. There was a time I wanted to become a monk and a very dear friend asked me to prototype the experience first, which was a great idea because after prototyping, I could decide, no, it's not for me. And um, a huge interest. Yeah, the nerd exists beyond, uh, in, much beyond engineering and management into studying three religions, a bunch of modalities. And, and it's all of these you know, journeys and explorations that come together in what I now see as a journey of crafting our lives, which goes on. It's not like a full stop. And that's why I use the word crafting. So we work with what we have, just like if you're making a piece of art or craft, right? And you have resources, other people contribute, you have, you're, you're constantly building, you're adding to it, you're removing, you're subtracting. It's, and it's, you're not the only person agent there, right? So you could be working on something and the wind comes and blows something away and then you have to start again. So there are other agents at play as well, people, not people, natural forces, and yet you keep building, improvising and moving on. And, uh, and that's the analogy captured in crafting. The idea that while there is a dimension of time, our careers, our lives, our outputs. So if you go back to the first 
you know, a slide where I had all these degrees in the fruits and the flowers. That's, it's not a linear journey. It's non-linear. And it's not just about the fruits and flowers. It's about a, a lot of what goes in, some of which can, if you use a judgmental lens, which I often did look ugly or bad or really, you know, things that you want to hide and feel ashamed about or not talk about. But each one of those experiences, it's, it's everything that makes us who we are. And owning all of that in a non-judgmental way, bringing the frame of non-judgment to that journey and taking it forward is pretty much at the heart of this approach. So while I'm better equipped to handle life's ups and downs, it's not a full stop now, right? So it's about making choices. So, um, so this is my book of poems, by the way, which I published, I think, in 2016. So it's got a a collection, a selection of poems, because I've written way too many, the ones that I felt were pivotal in shifting my, like I told you, I write poems mainly for myself. And then, you know, it becomes available to others. So the ones that I wrote in my, in the times I was stuck or depressed, the ones that created shifts and ahas for me have other ones that I've selected to go into that. And I think it's time for another volume because it's some years have passed, but yeah, so that is that is really the journey of crafting. I'm going to pause now and I'm going to ask all of you to do a little exercise. And I hope you have your pens and I'm sure if you're at home, you will have a pen and paper. Yeah, so, so now you become the case study. And I know this is going to be a short exercise. You will just start the journey now, but I promise you it's going to be a useful start that you really want to engage more with in your own time. So Take an A4 sheet of paper or just a blank page in your notebook. The bigger, the better. Start with one color, one pen. If you have other pen colors, it's great. You can add with that later, but start with whatever you have and create a non-linear sketch. And I mean non-linear because our CV, we tend to make our CVs very linear, right? So we want to make it all very chronological and neat. So allow, give yourself the permission to just go in a very scattered and non-linear way and depict your journey so far. Everything you've done. You can just put the big blocks, right? So think of my slide one, something like that, right? Put the big blocks. Think of slide two. Yeah, there's definitely more. Our lives are very rich. Our journeys are very big, but just put them as blobs, put them as bullet points, put them as boxes. And just have, you know, on one paper, the highlights capturing your life's journey so far. I'll give you five minutes to do that. And you can just give me a thumbs up or done on the chat when you've done that. Um, Ramya? Yeah? There's a request if you can show slide one again by Kushbu. Oh, sure. While this exercise is going on. Sure. Is that possible? Thank you. Yeah. Here's yeah. slide one, Kushbu. But please remember, add slide two and three also, okay? So <laughs> the highlights from your life.
Okay, I'm stopping the share so I can see your faces. Okay, so now step two. So you have all these big things on your uh, sheet. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna relook at that. And we're gonna bring in one of my favorite lenses, which is the lens of non-judgment. We're gonna look at it through that lens because man, is it powerful. And it is one of the lenses that has contributed the most to me in life. And which I think is a key essential and ingredient of what I'm calling the crafting approach, okay? So in order to introduce this lens, I'm gonna tell you a short story. So again, like I told you, one of you know my sources of um, whatever, ed educating myself has been Buddhism. So this is a story from the Zen. It's a Zen story and it's a beautiful story. It's short, but I think it's uh, something that uh, I keep going back to again and again. So there was a farmer who lived at the edge of a forest. He had a farm and he had many animals. His favorite animal was a black stallion a nice strong one. And one day this horse ran away into the forest. So the neighbors of the farmer came and they expressed their condolences and they said, we're so sorry about your loss. You lost your best horse. The farmer said, my horse ran away. That is true. Good thing, bad thing, who knows? Neighbors were a bit puzzled. Like he's just lost his favorite horse. But life went on. After two weeks, this horse comes back with three female horses. It was that kind of a horse. And the farmers come back and they're like celebration. The neighbors come back and they're like, oh, wow, it was a blessing in disguise. It was not a bad thing. And you've got four horses. This is so wonderful. The farmer says, my horse has come back. That's true. It's brought three more horses. That's true. Good thing, bad thing, who knows? Again, the neighbors were like, what's wrong with this man? <laughs> but they go back life goes on. Now this farmer had a 20 year old boy, a son, who used to help him on the farm. And thank you for those of you who are turning your videos on like Arti, please turn your videos on. <laughs> you make my day when you turn your videos on. I want to see all your pretty faces. So please do it. And uh, so this farmer had a 20 year old son who used to help him on the farm. And you know, wild horses need to be broken. One day, this one of the wild horses kicked him. He fell down. He had a fracture. He was badly injured. The neighbors came back and said, oh, my God, it was a curse. It was not a blessing. This is so sad. The farmer said, my son is injured. That's true. He has a broken bone. He's in pain. Good thing, bad thing, who knows? The neighbors started judging him again. What an unempathetic man. And what is wrong with him? But they go back to their homes. Two more weeks, a war breaks out in the kingdom. It's that kind of a war where the king has his ego on stake and he says, get all the men into, you know, get all the young men to join the army. They're doomed to lose anyway, but people are forcefully recruited. Guess who's not recruited? The one with a fracture. And all the other young men, boys, they go and they die, but this one survives and the fracture heals in seven weeks. And he's back and the neighbors come back and say, you know what, it was such a blessing. Your son is with you, with all of us. He's the only young man left in the village. And the farmer says, my son is with us. That's true. Good thing, bad thing, who knows? <laughs> and it goes on, right? And the story goes on, it doesn't end. And I love this because this is the story of my life. And this is the story of all our lives, isn't it? I mean, think of the times of one of the slides that you might have seen, one of the points in my slide where I talk about a series of romantic breakups and failures. Yes, it's, 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 been, it's been a disaster. I could write, so I could write a novel or my, my friends in hostel used to joke that there needs to be a movie made on my life, but I think it has to be multiple movies. So it's, and I can laugh about it then, but I tell you, it was not, it, it's not fun. It's not get fun to get dumped when you've given your heart to somebody. And it's not fun to break up when you thought you found the person you wanted to marry and spend your life with and move on. And, and, and these were even before my marriage, right? So uh, 
and in hindsight, I can actually use the good thing, bad thing lens on each one of these. And it works so brilliantly, even for the failures and the misfits in my early corporate experiences and every one of them, because every one of those experiences has led to some kind of new door opening, some kind of growth, some kind of development. Has it been, hasn't it been that way for you as well? And you know, the same thing with the so-called good things. There were things that happened, which I was thinking and people around me were thinking, well, this is the best thing. And, and after some time I was like, oh my God, what was I thinking? Why did I get myself into this? And the very thing that you love so much turns out to be the thing that's holding you, strangling you or holding you as a prison. Has it happened to you? Because it's happened to me. And, and that's why I love this story. And what I realize now is that as human beings, our brains just don't have the capacity. We don't have the information. We don't have a complete and holistic understanding. And we can't of how things are going to unfold to be actually be able to judge things as good, bad, right, or wrong. And that's what judgment is. Then why do it at all? If it's going to be an inaccurate chapa, a chapa that we might have to revise later, then why use that chapa? Why use that lens? See, the reason, and, and this is not just in the time dimension, this story brings out the futility of using that chapa or lens of judgment, the one that the neighbors were doing in the time dimension, because we never know. We never know how one thing will cascade and unfold into another. But the futility also, you know, there's also the space dimension. And when I say space, I mean uh, laterally, which uh, let me give you examples. It'll become clearer. I make a choice that I think is great for me. And then I realize, oh, it's not so good for my son or not so good for my parents or other people. As a community, I live in a campus. I still live in the IMP campus. So we make a we decide to do something that's great for our campus. And we've done that. And then we realize it's not really good for the neighbors and people around us. On planet Earth, haven't we done that as a human species? We've made so many choices that we think are great for our development. And then we realize, oh my God, we're hurting the fishes. We're hurting the other species. And it's doctors do that all the time, right? They prescribe medicines or things that help us or help us in one ailment or one part of our body. And then we realize and they realize that, oh my God, but you know, it's had all these other side effects or other things. And I'm not blaming anyone or anything. It doesn't mean we don't make choices. It doesn't mean we don't take actions. We have to make choices. We have to take actions on the basis of whatever we think is best at that point in time. But without the insistence and a conviction that this is definitely the best thing or this is definitely a good thing because we never know enough to do that. And that's judgment. So abstaining from judgment is not abstaining from choices. It's not abstaining from action. It's just that absent, uh, abstaining from judgment, just the labels. Similarly, it's not, it's not about, um, okay, I'll, I'll, how do I put this? Uh, it's not denial. So for example, when, and, and that's how this is different from the, you know, have you heard of the Pollyanna syndrome of positivity? taken to an extreme right and denial thing <laughs> and denial never helps and by the way I've done that been there <laughs> and learned it the hard way and denial and suppression doesn't help as well so this story is again beautiful remember the farmer when his son had a fracture the son is in pain yes it's hurting him it's an inconvenience he's not denying that but he's not insisting that because the boy is bedridden, it's a bad thing. Try using this. Oh my God, I've used this on my, uh, so one of the points, if you've not noticed um, in slide two was as a kid, I was diagnosed as a very weak child, <laughs> kept falling ill. My parents, poor things, taken me to infinite doctors, all kinds of naturopathy, homeopathy, allopathy. More, and they found things and they didn't find things. And you know, so that's been one of the reasons why I've really been very interested also in exploring, you know, yoga and healing and lots of forms of therapy. And if I, and by the way, thankfully, I've, uh, I, re, I still remember in hostel, you know, a senior coming and telling me, oh, this one is always sick. And I felt so bad, but she was right because I was in some ways always sick and always ill. But I'm not like that now. I'm not always sick and ill anymore. And uh, one of the things <clears throat> that's really, really helped me is to not look at sickness and illness as a bad thing, taking that judgment off. 
and and re really here it's just about looking at the larger picture in education right educating ourselves more and more about how the body works for example when we have loosies clap for it and say body thank you you're pushing out something stupid that i ate yesterday or something that you can't tolerate thank you for pushing it out instead of suppressing it when we have fever thank you body because you recognize there's some germs that need to be fought and you're increasing your temperature and i know if you take it to 104 that's not good so i will take the paracetamol and keep it at 102 or 1 or whatever i want but thank you for fighting away these germs a lot of what we call illness and sickness a lot of it is just the outside right the symptoms and you take away the judgment and you see that the body is doing its work always trying its best so now we take away this lens of judgment and take i want you to take it out from your life's journey this entire life's journey right so look at everything that you've written on that a4 sheet and i hope you've put in the personal the professional all these buckets that we use look at all of it and say and look at it say if there was nothing right nothing wrong nothing good nothing bad why because these are man made labels and i hope i've convinced you now that they're very fraud labels my son calls it scam okay so he's picked up this the new age word scam so good bad right wrong these labels are scams scams that we've been used to if you take away these labels and then look at that journey um so for those of you who are also wondering and who's sort of doubting and thank you for your video because this helps me understand that some of you are not so convinced that i'm saying this is a, a big scam let me tell you the utility of judgment why it even exists okay at least as the way i understand it see when we were kids most we started learning to judge from people around us right and it's a bit like the training wheels on a cycle our parents tell us hey don't touch fire that's a bad thing don't don't talk to strangers that's a bad thing good good bad right wrong they're given to us as these safety mechanisms to keep us safe but we make them very absolute and then we take it and and uh, this i know because i've studied a lot about how the brain works our brains are just simple programmable devices neurons that fire together wire together if you've heard that before okay and when we hear something over and over again it's like those those pathways in our brain are actually covered with layers of fat that we call lipid they become like high speed networks and our brain is trying to support us to make that very quick and fast and accessible to us and that usually supports us but it's not necessarily a good thing let me prove it to you guys and i love this group again because you have your videos on so i know I know I I know when to go into what okay so um or what will contribute so let's do a little math game here okay so you can use the chat window or you can mute your unmute yourself if you're in a quiet place for this exercise that's so sweet arun namma says scam just stay with me yes <laughs> okay so a little bit of math okay what is 3 into 4 12 Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, what is four into five? Twenty. Twenty. Okay, what is five into five? Twenty-five. Three into three? Nine. Nine. Awesome. One more. What is six into six? Thirty-six. Lovely. Thank you, Vishali. Okay, now, um, what is seventeen into twenty-three? That's fair. <laughs> I'm using. No one's trying it. Okay, we need to try out with books here now. <laughs> okay, let's wait for an answer, or even without an answer, if I give you enough time, you can do it, right? Anyone? Yeah. Thank you. So, Please, if I give you enough time, you can all do it because you know how to calculate. Yeah. Now, when I asked you six into six or three into three, did you calculate? Even though you know how to calculate, no. no. Why? Anybody? we kind of have those memorized already in our brain so absolutely right it's uh, yeah you use the word stored or memorized what's really happening is remember those connections that i talked about in the brain you've just repeat neurons that fire together wire together anything that we repeat again and again the brain says this is very important this is very useful i'll make this a very pakka connection for you okay so we've done that three into three so many times either through memorizing or through we've just used it right in all the work that we do that our brain says very useful make it hard 
Now let's do experiment number two, and I need a volunteer for that. Shall we? Who wants to volunteer? Thank I you. Go. Okay, Shweta raised her hand first, so we'll just Shweta unmute yourself. <laughs> And uh, I want everyone to watch Shweta's face when she's answering this, okay? So everybody else watch her. And don't get self-conscious, Shweta. <laughs> but I ask you a very tough question and I want you to answer this. What is seven into seven? 49. Okay, so Shweta, I told you it's tough. So think about it, double check, ask a friend if you want and then answer and you can unmute yourself. What is, shall we unmute Shweta? I think she's still muted. No, I think I answered. I know, I'm oh, you are. Okay, we, someone yeah. spotlighted the wrong Shweta. Okay, good, yeah. Okay, so Shweta, you can think again. Seven into seven. Double okay. check. Are you sure? You don't need more time? No. You don't want to check this? No. Fully confident? Yes. You're sure you are heard the question properly? Seven into seven. Yes, seven into seven. If anybody is <laughs> saying it wrong, please feel free to say it in the chat. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Okay, so we can unspotlight her now. Okay. Um, so, shall we unspotlight her? No, I'm not using the spotlight. We'll just use oh. whoever the speaker is, they'll come on. Okay, yeah. fine, sure, lovely. Okay, thank you, Shweta. Okay, so if you notice, she's, um, you know, she's actually very good natured because she laughed, she got amused, <laughs> and but she was confident. And where did that confidence come from? It's just from the thickness of that brain. That's it, right? Nowhere else. It just comes from there, from that. Now, sometimes in workshops, and I am not going to use the gender angle here, but, you know, often it, it's, it's more common again with um, male participants. And when I do this and when I really push them, they get angry, they get irritated. They're like, how dare you question me? Are you wasting your time? Like, why are you doing this? And that's a totally natural reaction too. Shweta has just got amused, but people can get angry. Why our brain will get angry? Because, you know, the brain's agenda in making that thick was to make you help you do it faster, save your time, make you more effective and efficient. And now you're questioning it. The brain is like, I made this strong so that I won't have to keep going back and questioning it. Don't make me go there. I know this is true. Seven into seven is 49. It's true. It's sealed. And that's what is important about our beliefs, about anything that we hold a lot. And the judgments, the things that we believed as good, bad, right, wrong, and the way we put it into judgments. So one of the things, for example, and I'll just take, I'm just taking, I'll take two little examples here. So I struggled a lot with initial parenting. I took two years completely off my work, and which was PhD then. And I just couldn't go back to work because I had this belief in my head that a good mother needs to be with her kid all the time, a full-time parent can't work. And it was just a belief. And now I know where I got that belief from, but that's not so important, actually. You don't always need to so trace the source in order to let go of a belief that's not working. So my mom had given up her work to look after us, and she would got a lot of praise for that from people, and she had left her good career, and she was full-time. And so it was a very pakka belief in my head. So in my head, it was good mothers have to be with their kids all the time, therefore can't go to work. So if I go to work, I'm being a bad mother. No one was stopping me. No one. Everyone around me. Everyone. Parents, in-laws, husband, everyone was like, go, go, go. <laughs> I could not because it was clashing with my belief of this is what good mothers do. And I had to be that good mother, right? Nice cage of judgment. And uh, it, 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 took, it was a wake-up incident, actually, that, you know, I've uh, written about it in greater detail. But really, a, a time when I was hanging out with other stay-at-home moms and we were bitching about the working moms when I realized you know that oh my god why am I bitching and then I realized that the self-esteem and goodness I was getting by you know and the brain does this by putting down others so that I can feel better and I was like oh my god there's so much judgment here and then release the judgment and guess what came with it the freedom to choose it didn't mean I had to start working again, but given my interests and temperaments and the stifled creativity and all of that, I chose to work again. 
and our judgments that way become our prisons, the beliefs, right? Um, I'll give you another example. I talk, um, you know, I talked about, I had a very toxic relationship with money. So I had all these hangups and beliefs about money is bad, money is evil, the, the, the rich people are like this, poor people, tons of crap. It was so bad that when I started working on my money mindset, my money beliefs, my relationship with money, I was amazed at the kachra that was coming out. And I used the word kachra, like literally it was toxic. And I was like, oh my God. Again, tons of judgment, picked up early childhood, reinforced, reinforced, reinforced to a point where unless you're going out and saying, oh, you know what, I want to let go of it. That's the inside out approach. The brain's not going to go there. It's like the seven into seven. We're just going to keep, keep using it in our calculations and in our behavior and conversations and keep reinforcing it. We're going to stop. So what helps is to stop really examine, are you sure? Eventually Shweta opened up, okay, I will look into this. Anyone else has a different point? So that's what, so my, you know, so for me, the one of the first times when I started recognizing, for example, the money thing, the deeper it is, the more you're not like, okay, everyone's saying this, maybe there's another side to looking at money that I haven't looked at so far, maybe, and then you start investigating into it, okay? So um, as kids, we pick up these things, A, from the conversations, judgments, and, you know, warnings and things that are told to us from outside, from advertising these days a lot, right? And advertising isn't just Virat Kohli coming and saying, you must do this. That also works, by the way, our brain picks it up, which is why advertisers spend so much money on that. But also the more subtle things, like, you know, the other day I walked into Fortis and there was these advertisements of um, how you have to look after aged people parents and what being a good child means very subtle messaging filled with happiness and this is what true joy is but very powerful but basically they are telling me what it means to be a good child or what it means what health should mean or what caring should mean or what should con what should be my definition of happiness they're telling me all of that all of that is also, it's just like advertisement, right? Conditioning, what your second standard teacher told you, what your uncles told you. And most importantly, what we tell ourselves. What we tell ourselves as kids, because we, we are also clever. Remember I told you, I've been writing poems, writing letters to God. And, and even if you're not a writer, writer like me, because like for me, I write and I think when I write, so I first pick up the pen or nowadays hit the keyboard and then the thoughts come. But even the rest of you, you're thinking and talking to yourself, don't you? So as a kid, a lot of us created what I would call these early hypotheses on success and survival. And depending on your your own situations. So um, let's use one as an example here. Uh, think of yourself at around the age of three, four, five. That's a good time to pick for this one. And fill in the blanks here. In order to succeed and survive, I need to X, Y, Z. How would the three or a four-year-old you fill it? There could be multiple, but go with the first few that come up. So you can write this again, in order to succeed and survive or survive and succeed because survival is more important for the kid. I need to dash, dash, dash. Take a minute and write the first few words or phrases that come for you on a different sheet of paper, not the same one. And I see some of you smiling, right? When you catch yourself. So lovely. Yeah, I know. I've been that parent pleaser too. That's, that's, so, that's so huge. You know, one of the things that came up for me when I did this was I need to be better than others. Okay. And uh, I have an older sister who's a year and a half older than me. And... Uh, I think that she's just a star at everything. And I always did think she was. And so even, and you know, and I'm not judging myself anymore, but the little Ramya just felt that, oh my God, she had to be better than that, you know, that other star in the house and possibly to get the love and affection of parents and all the neighbors and the teachers and everyone else. And it became so important. And I now recognize that as a hyper-competitive streak, which 
which is also one, it's something that's actually in the extreme for me. And it's made, made it very toxic because it came in the way of my friendship. It came in the way of me being a kind and caring person who could help other people. So when I was in school, I would like, you know, um, and I was really good at math. I was like, you know, one of my whatever gifts. And if my friends would come and ask me to help them, if they were like good students, I would help like this. If they were really not good, then I would help. Why? Because I have to guard my position. And there is, I'm not saying there isn't the kind, caring aspect of me, but the competitive aspect of me is the one that's the bigger agenda for surviving and succeeding. And that continued and continued and continued and continues, but less and less and less as I'm working more and more and, you know, really questioning that really, <laughs> do I need to be better than others in order to survive and succeed? And as that voice goes down, as that belief goes down, then the other, other aspects of me can actually surface, can show up, can show up in what I do, how I behave, how I make friends, relationships, relate, all of that. The risks I take, right? Because, um, yeah, in, in terms of all of that. Okay, so this is really how judgment, we start getting these judgments and beliefs. Most, a lot of them are in early childhood and we hold on to them. So if you're convinced now that the absolute good, bad, right, wrong don't help us, they hurt us. The rights also don't hurt, don't help. I gave you the good mother example, right? So also if I'm, you know, uh, so the good judgments are as much of prisons as the bad judgments. And we use these not just on ourselves, the lens of judgment, we use them on others also. Why? Like I told you, in order, if I'm using the lens of judgment on myself, A, I want to tell myself, you know, so I want to make, be constantly rationalizing it by judging everyone else around me also. And then we take that lens of judgment into situations also. This is a bad thing that happened. This is a tragic thing. This is a totally, really bad thing. And this should not have happened. What if instead of this should not have happened, we replace it with, I, who am I to decide? I anyway not got to decide whether it happened or not. It's happened. Now let me look at what are the gifts that have unfolded what are the opportunities that have unfolded as a result of it happening and see what to do with it. That's the crafting approach. Looking into the future, into the creation, into the crafting. But in order to take that approach into the future, we really need to look at the past without judgment. So go back on your sheets and look at it with removing judgment from it. And uh, Charu, is uh, how are we doing on time? Is it good for a breakout group or we're really short of time now, right? So, so, we so we're, we're at 12, 11 right now. Yeah. So you 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 let me know. Yeah. And, you so, know, we would, and we would like to keep about a few minutes in the end okay. for any q &A. So what I will do then is I'll just leave this as a take home activity. Okay. Looking at the sheet that you've created without the lens of judgment. And, um, I'll also let you know that if you do have a gang of people, two, three people that you can share this with and you could form small groups if you're all connected within your cohort itself and do it, it's wonderful to do this with another person. It just adds more or, you know, in a small group and you can sort of uh, make it like a small group activity also. So Rame, how long would this take, this activity? Uh, you know, uh, what I do in workshops is a sampler and it's never enough. Okay. So, okay. Okay. No problem. You know, it's it's like I picked up this good mother thing, right? And you could pick up different things. You could do weekly meetings. It's an ongoing thing. So I really leave it. To okay. You. okay. Okay. So the theme is really to look at our journey so far. Look at everything that's happened because that is our fodder. That is the colors and crayons and the tools that we're going to be using to craft our future life, right? And that's what we have. That's also, apart from being the resources and the gifts and everything that we have so far, it's also our prisons. It's also our limitations and roadblocks. So working on that so that we can then make more empowered choices in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah. So making our canvas bigger, opening up the prisons, pulling out more strengths, gifts, resourcefulness. Okay, let me um, 
take you through a, um, one or two more slides and then we can do Q&A because I think Q&A is so rich. Okay. So I obviously overestimate the time every time and okay. this is just me. So um, yeah, so just, just yeah, part of my journey, everything that I did, I really like have been very selfish in my motivation. I, I didn't set out to help others or teach others or any of that. It's all, all been self-therapy. Let me just find a way to live, flow, you know, float, stay afloat and eventually then start making my life into something beautiful that I would want to own and live as. And it just happened to turn into a body of work that over the, the years I realized, hey, you know what, this can actually help others as well. So that's really where I've been coming from. Uh, so one of the things in this, in creating this whole body of work called Crafting of Life is that, and the reason why I created is that, you know, people started reaching out to me and I'm sure people reach out to everybody, right? So you would have people reaching out as well and you would reach out. And, you know, on specific things, like maybe relationship and career and this and health. And, and it sort of really started bothering me in a way because I was feeling handicapped because, you know, I, at one level, I can understand, I can empathize. And I've been in similar places. I've had been in very messy, very tricky, very dark places, if I may say so. But I couldn't really help a lot of people. I could help some. And the reason why I would often feel handicapped is really because of this. Okay. That a lot of time people are looking for quick fix solutions. Now, I do not know if quick fix solutions exist or not, but I don't have any. So what I really have is and that's just been my approach to understand, 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 understand about the way the brain works, understand about the way the universe works, understand about the way our body, mind complex and energy fields work and using all of that to craft our lives, to liberate ourselves and liberate ourselves so that we can create what we want to in the future. And this can take time. For me, it's taken decades. It can take, you know, and it's, it's an ongoing process and, and I can shorten that process but I can't do it for anybody and I can't make it really, really short. And people have to use these tools. So they're really tools. So, you know, today we talked about judgment and unfolding and, um, and it can seem like, you know, you can have a sort of ease in the workshop itself, listening to, okay, wow, but it's going to really work for you only if you go back and do the work. If you go back and actually start removing that you know, those chapas of judgment that you've put on various aspects of yourself, your life, your journey. And that's your work. I can't do it for another person. Uh, and changing our lives or crafting our lives is also a messy but beautiful process. I love to use gardening as an analogy, right? And there isn't a right answer. And this is where there is the inner world and there is the outer world. So let me take you through some of these. It's rich, it's complex and it's ongoing. Um, so we make choices, they turn into habits. So for example, if you make a choice and you say, I will stop judging myself, others and situations from now, it's a choice. You don't do it because you have to, you do it because you choose to. You say, you know what? Judgment is an outdated. <laughs> it's some crazy habit that people do. I'm not gonna do it you choose. And the more you practice, it turns into habit. It becomes your new normal. And, and, and it does start becoming your new normal because when I, the more I started practicing this, the more, you know, when people would just use adjectives to let me know how they felt in talking with me or in the feedback, I started seeing people, oh, you're one of the most non-judgmental people I've met. And it's not like I went out to say, hey, see me as this, but it becomes your new normal, the place from where you operate. And that then opens you up to make more choices and it goes on, it's cyclical. Now the world outside, including others, respond to our new and changed selves. So when I was the complaining, 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 people would respond to me in a certain way. 
when I'm not complaining as much, hopefully, and instead when I'm, you know, asking more questions and looking at possibilities, those conversations go differently and they, they turn into different kinds of opportunities, which wouldn't have happened otherwise. Okay, so that's the new opportunities and possibilities become available. New wounds and limit, limiting beliefs come up. Oh, this is, I'm going to use the metaphor of body healing here because it's just, you know, more understandable. Our body is very kind. <laughs> it won't, and if you notice, it won't make you heal all the crap inside of you altogether because you can't handle it. It's like think of loose motion from everywhere all the time just because there's so much. So you get rid of some and then it says, ye bhi saaf karo, ye bhi saaf karo, ye bhi saaf karo. The same thing with our beliefs and inner worlds and all the judgments and everything that's taking us, right? The more we work on ourselves, the more stuff actually comes up and that's because of two reasons i believe in the kindness of a presence of a universal <laughs> thing but you know if you don't even believe in that just logically it's like if you're cleaning a pipe or something right you remove one surface you yourself can now see you can see more you can actually say oh i'm, I'm being so judgmental about that also so your awareness gets sharpened and you can see more clearly and then you can clear out more and as that happens we access more of our power and potency yeah, so you feel better about yourself. Oh, I'm not that screwed up. I'm not that stupid. So you recognize and you start owning your power. And you start saying, you know what? I can do this. I did this. I did this. And now I can do this. And with that, now you become a stronger, more powerful artist and sculptor of your life. Right? And then we can choose from that power, power and place of strength. So it's a very non-linear, cyclical and ongoing journey. So it's so this workshop or, you know, any of the workshops I do, it's not like I come in and teach you something. It's, it's the body of work is something that you can keep engaging with and using it in you. So, so I think the artist metaphor is perfect. It's like, you know, you can go to art class forever <laughs> or you can go once and then you can just choose to just lead yourself in your own journey of art. So, um, I don't uh, aim to try to or promise to, and I think I'm not even capable of solving anyone's problems. But what I do believe I have now to offer is tools and techniques and a body of work to empower you to treat them as possibilities. And I won't even say solve them or wish that they go away because problem itself is sort of like a semi-judgmental word, right? It's most problems are just situations that you can turn into possibilities. Yeah. So, and I say semi-judgmental because I've seen some people use the word problem, but they don't have any judgment associated. They're like, oh, fine, let's solve it. Right. But sometimes we use the word problem with judgment. So it's not the word per se, but the energy and the emphasis with which you're using it. So the approach of crafting our lives and the body of work that I've created has something for everyone. So I'm just using scuba diving as a metaphor. So, so in sessions like this, you, this, you know, in, so at one point I was like, you know what, uh, what can you do in one hour? What can you do in 90 minutes? Like, you know, this is a long, deep journey. And then I said, no, there's this, there's something that you can always do. There's windows you can open. There's a conversation you can have. Maybe there's a switch that may or may not work. Right. So there are what I call surface level tips, offerings, and I have, you know, uh, offerings that are short and I have them on my YouTube channel as well as, you know, putting them all over these days. But there's also, I want you to know that, you know, for those of you who'd like to go deep and explore, this is, it can be a very, very deep journey and very rewarding and very beautiful. And, and it's an invitation. It's only if you feel like, right? There's more. Okay, we're gonna skip. I wanted to go deep into self-image, but we can skip all of that. And uh, yeah, before I take questions, I just wanted to leave you with an open invitation to come and explore the body of work that I have created. And you can access everything from my website. So craftingourlives.com. And I will send uh, give you on the chat window a link that you can use to sign up for my free newsletter as well. And uh, yeah, there, there are different ways that you can engage with this body of work. It's not linear, it's multifaceted. For those who believe in God, universe, you can take that. For those who don't, because I'm surrounded by people who don't, and I, 
that, that doesn't have to come in your way. So in fact, 90% of the content that I've put out there is for atheists. <laughs> but I myself am a strong believer. Like there's nothing that lights me up more than the idea of a God. And uh, it doesn't have to come in your way is what I'm saying. The tools can be used by <laughs> whether you believe in a concept and construct of God and universe or whether you just want to look at yourself as the source of your life. It works most like actually everything in public domain works for uh, yeah whichever camp you are in okay because I have a husband and son and tons of friends in the other camp so I created content that can be used anyway okay and uh, yeah so let's take questions yes um, we had a question earlier on uh, from one second from Neha who just wanted to know that when you spoke about depression, was it postpartum depression? Um, yes, part of it was, it peaked because of that. But what uh, got diagnosed is, I was depressed even before that, but it hadn't been diagnosed. So it was there, it hadn't been diagnosed. And it the postpartum was when it really peaked and got much stronger. So yes. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yeah, hi, hi, Ramya. Yeah. Yeah, this is Rosmi here. So when you told, like, you were compared with your sister, like, you are uh, inner self, me and you're judging yourself. So you compared saying, like, she's a star and I need to be better than her. Yeah, I mean, that is something which uh, I, I could very much resonate. It hit a chord inside me because uh, I've been, I, I have two younger sisters, okay? I'm the elder one. So what happens is, um, in, I have two questions. Okay, first one I'll just come. So question is, uh, so being the elder one, uh, but I was little on a, a healthier side, and both of them were very light. So they, I mean, people used to tease me saying, uh, "Hey, you eat full meals. You don't give anything, or you don't leave anything for your sisters." And I used to, uh, I mean, be the, the topper, maybe the first third, first three uh, levels in the class. So they'll be compared with me saying, hey, you have to score same school, okay? All three of us. So, you know, uh, your teachers also know it. So mm -hmm. I, I could feel that they are getting angry because they are being compared with me. And on the other side, uh, everybody compares me saying, like, I'm on the healthier side. And why don't you lose or you don't also, like, become thin so that uh, you will also be looking nice like sisters. They were very pretty, I should say that, and I acknowledge so these are the uh, wounds, okay? So first thing is like, yeah, that is something which happened, okay? Past is past, it happened in the childhood. So what I need to check is, I should not be repeating it with my son because he is also like, I know, right? When whatever I, you told me, you say that good mother example. Similarly, I I'll, I'll also should not be doing that. I should compare my son with others and he also should not get that judging. So, Post that, what will happen is whatever I have gone through, like maybe it is with the comparison or how how can I uh, don't take that, I mean, consciously decide this will not continue uh, for my son also. And for healing also, like I, I till now, I never talked very freely with my sisters. I knew they have a tough time because of me. My good score on the 10th, they, they'll classify, right? 10th is everything. Or when I went to engineering, uh, they were compared, yeah, you had to also do like Didi. So I could feel like it's creating gaps and unhealthy gaps, okay? I mean, we are from the same family, <laughs> from the same mom and dad, but we're being compared. And for them, I mean, for me, I feel like, yeah, I should be also uh, take care of my health and lose weight so that I'll be looking as pretty as them. So that is something, and that's the first point. The second one is like, how can I don't have this continued to my son and his generation? Beautiful. Thanks. So, uh, Rosmi, welcome. Rosmi, thank you for being so vulnerable and asking. And uh, you have articulated it beautifully. And let me tell you, um, this is probably true for more people than just you and me. <laughs> and I know this because of being in, in a coaching journey, right? Uh, being a coach. So um, I'll give you the surface level tips, right? Yeah. And uh, which is what I can do in a state like this. So one of the best antidotes to everything that's created because of comparison, competition, 
by outsiders, parents, teachers, and by ourselves is to, um, so there's the unraveling part, but what I'm going to give you is almost like a workaround is to really honor, appreciate, and celebrate the uniqueness of yourself. First yourself, and then automatically of other people will come. Okay, it's a great workaround. It's not the only way of dealing with this, but it's it's really easy for me to explain here and you can start using it right away. So remember this A4 shade that you put your life's journey and all of that, you take non-judgmental lens and then you look at it. After that, look at it and celebrate the uniqueness of that. And you can do this individually, you can do this in your groups if you're going to meet up in groups and help one another, right? And you'll see that, oh my God, not your sister, not anybody, not anybody has that, right? You're completely this unique item, unique piece. And celebrate it like, oh gosh, there's nobody else like me on the planet. So unique. And totally fall in love with that complete designer, unique item that you are. Like item number two, <laughs> maybe. Like once you start doing that, you know, the, the comparison game, it's like, you know, you're going into the differentiation game now. You're like, I'm so unique. I'm not going to get my self-esteem and kicks and charge from saying I'm better than you. But like, doesn't make sense, right? It sort of loses its validity. Right, and right. the more you do that, uh, and I'm giving you just one approach here, but you know, what will happen is don't, even without focusing on healing that relationship with the siblings and the other people, because you, our brain is, uh, there's something called projection in psychology. So it's like, chor ko sara, sara dunia chor lagta hai. have you heard that? That's called projection in psychology. So true, right? When you're pregnant, you're actually noticing all the others were pregnant. So just like that, when you're celebrating and loving your uniqueness, without even teaching and telling yourself that I need to celebrate and um, acknowledge other people's uniqueness, your brain is doing that for you. You're using, you're using these hardwired biases. You're using projection to your advantage. And when you see their uniquenesses, when you're celebrating yourself, you, your brain will start celebrating them. You'll start falling in love with them and the warmth will start coming. Like, oh my God, my sister is such an item. <laughs> like, oh my God, she's such a weird, different, unique piece, right? Without the judgment, celebration of the uniqueness, you can only like her and care over it. Like it's right. starting to open up. So use this as an approach. Right. There are, of course, ways to go in and heal the wounds and all also. But this is a really nice uh, work around right. uh, for your kid. I would suggest the same thing. So uh, you're not the only force in his life or her life. I, I, I mean, I recognize that. Right. Uh, there's a village. Big so yes. You may not compare, but others will. So you, of course, don't. That's fine. Right. But others around would be. So, again, you empower your kid to do things, activities in whichever way to honor, recognize and celebrate himself or herself as this completely unique creature. Right. And then the uniqueness comes and then there's no war. It's like a garden where they can have a dahlia, a sunflower and a rose. And how do you compare right. color, size, height? Like you all all the flowers, and right? unique. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. So actually, we we are just in time. So, uh, you know, um, uh, Ramya, if you can actually just leave that link where people can sign up for your newsletter. I will just in the it. chat and or send it to me and I will mail it out to everybody. But um, thank you so much for this. This You know, 90 minutes has gone by so fast where you've actually given us, you know, started our journeys of how we can craft our lives and look at it in a non-medial, non-judgmental way. And uh, thank you so much on behalf of all our participants and thank you to all our participants for being here.